Welcome back to the Rally podcast, where we continue our journey into the world of education. Now, this project is funded by Erasmus Plus and is really dedicated to rethinking active learning and distance education. In the second episode of our three-part series, we're going to take a look at problem-based learning, which you also hear about in, in PBL or CBL, which is actually case-based learning. They're both vital techniques in modern education. In this episode, we will hear from our experts discussing their journey with PBL from traditional teaching experiences to really embracing PBL's strengths, but also its limitations. To share what it's like going from traditional classes to now really engaging students through real world problem solving and doubling down on critical thinking and learning as a team. In this talk, we also cover how PBL adapts to various learning styles from all the students and the role of facilitators in a PBL setting. I'm Tom, and I will be the moderator of this conversation. So I will be really ready to dive deep into these topics, probing our experts for good insights, but also good answers. Now, if you want to know more about our project and everything that we published, you can visit our website at aralde.eu or you can go to our YouTube channel called The Real Day Project. But first, let's hear it from our guests. So I'm a physician. Um, in the last 25, 30 years, I've worked as a palliative care physician, actually. But my background is in family medicine, and I've worked a lot over the years uh, very closely with primary care. I was born and raised in South Africa, and I did my medical training, my undergraduate degree in South Africa, and I was trained in a very traditional approach. In other words, the first few years you do your pharmacology, your anatomy, you know, all those sciences, totally disconnected to patients or the real world. And then suddenly in about the fourth year, you uh, at the bedside of a patient, and now you're trying to connect desperately what you learned in the first few years with what's happening in front of you. Um, and so I worked in South Africa for a few years, and then I ended up in Canada, and I ended up working as a family physician in a rural part of Canada. And it was during those years that I became interested in palliative care, and so ended up specializing in palliative care at one of the universities in Canada, so University of Alberta up in Edmonton, pretty cold, but a nice city. And it was there that I first encountered uh, PBL, problem-based learning, because I was doing some courses and they were designed as PBL. And so I started seeing the strengths of PBL and as well some of the limitations. I then ended up uh, uh, becoming affiliated with the university. So I got an academic appointment and became very interested in education. So in 1997, I developed an online learning program on palliative care because the challenge then was to reach out to rural-based healthcare professionals. So there were several challenges. One was how do you reach out to folks who are very far away from any city, quite distant? And also, at that time, we started recognizing the importance of interprofessional learning. So how do you bring different professions together to learn? And so I developed what became, I think, was the first course accredited by the College of Family Physicians of Canada, the first online course, an interprofessional course. So that was back in 97, 99. And in that course, I started applying principles of problem-based learning. Um, and so it was, it was interesting because I was, it, you also had to modify it for the online milieu and, and, and the technology at the time. I then, in 2000, started a very big project in Canada that, that's become, it's called Pallium Canada, P-A-L-L-I-U-M Canada. It's a large non-profit organization now. And the whole goal is to train up healthcare professionals across the country in an interprofessional way on the core competencies around palliative care. So we've got these courses called LEAP, which stand for Learning Essential Approaches to Palliative Care. These are short courses of one to two days long. And over the years, since then, we've trained over 60,000 healthcare professionals, and we've got different versions of the courses, but we, we use a combination, I would say more case-based learning, so CBL and a few other learning programs. But 
in the meantime, I got my master's degree in, in medical education. And then a few years ago, got my PhD as well in education. And, and that includes the different learning methods such as PBL, CBL, et cetera. And Ooh. I'm now uh, in the last year in Nevada, in Spain. That sounds like a very, very interesting trajectory that you've already been doing. You've been doing a lot and like developing courses back in 97. I don't think that was something that was very straightforward to do that online, I guess. I mean, no, it wasn't. I mean, look, I, I'm, not, I'm not a tech savvy guy and never was. So it was interesting learning the technology, but also understanding different learning methods for the delivery medium. Because it's not a matter, one of the hard lessons I learned very quickly, it's not a matter just of taking a classroom learning courseware, you know, your curriculum, your syllabus, and then just putting it online. You mm -hmm. have to understand the profile of online learners and what can facilitate online learning, enhancing it, et cetera. So it was a steep learning curve with, with some errors along the way, but, but fascinating. And it's interesting how over the years, having learned how to do online learning, I think has helped me better in the classroom. So it's yeah. been... Can I uh, can I ask a question, Jose? In the you already started early then with online teaching uh, for problem based learning. The direct contact between people to discuss things is very important. But I think in the nineteen nineties, things like Zoom and Teams and so was still not there. So how did you get people to interact with each other? Yeah, uh, good question. So yeah, the technology was was not there yet. Um, no. We just started testing a software program to do live, what today is called webinars, and we do it um, easily. But at the time, it was really difficult, and the bandwidth wasn't there to do it. So we, so we ended up relying a lot on asynchronous uh, discussions, so okay. asynchronous online discussions. And, and then that became interesting because the principles of, of PBL started being applied. I quickly learned that um, one needs to be a guide on the side instead of the sage on the stage. So if you want to get discussions going, you put out questions. You don't follow up with the answers right away and you try to solicit uh, um, discussions. But it was all asynchronous. So there wasn't that immediacy. There wasn't. But, but it's interesting because there, there was even some socializing. Um, you know, there was, there was interesting work done by Randy Garrison um, at the time at the University of Alberta around communities of inquiry and and they were doing work into what does these asynchronous discussions look like and they found things like there's a cognitive presence in these discussion boards but there's also a social presence oh hi you know so it was interesting how people got to know each other even through the asynchronous um, and probably media. also like some some accountability between the different members of those groups Yes, yeah, and to be honest, I never thought of it that way. But yes, absolutely. And looking, reflecting back, yes, because in order for learning to occur, everyone had to do their part. Mm -hmm. If you didn't, there was this, there was this silence. Um, and from a from a from a teacher perspective or, or facilitator professor, uh, perspective, it was the timing was so important. You can't just jump in very quickly. You've got to wait. If you wait for too long, and there's a wrong or in inaccurate concept emerging that people have got maybe incorrectly or understood it incorrectly. If you jump too quickly to, to stop it, you stifle the discussion. If you wait for too long, you endorse it. So it was that, but, but yeah, the accountability reflecting back on it, you're, you're right. I never thought of it at the time is that way. That's stuff that I like the accountability part, um, because I'm more involved now in the online, um, online courses and like getting people involved with online courses. Like that's something that's sometimes really difficult. Like a lot of students will buy a course, for example, but they will never finish it because like they bought it and they feel like they've already participated in it. So the accountability part is where memberships or um, for example, like group, like having group meetings actually benefits. But yeah, and yeah. I think that's I think... a good point, uh, Tom, because I, I think what we men what we saw in COVID, right, during the COVID pandemic, we also had to switch on-site meetings to online meetings, right? And and personally, um, I, I found it, it, it the switch was 
quite abrupt, right? From one uh, one moment to the other, we had to switch to online sessions, and students actually, yeah, they they were able to hide behind the screen yeah. by just being there, but not taking the accountability, right? And that that yeah. was actually better when we had the on on site meetings. But then gradually people started to get used to the online situation and then it improved. But in the beginning, it was really like, okay, I'm here in my, my, in my room, sitting behind the screen, no. just being there, right? And, yeah. and that was a pity, but, but it grew better over time. I think that's also part of like uh, another different and difficult conversation, maybe about privacy and like uh, how much are some students willing to share about their personal lives? Um, something that like nobody really knew at the time as well. So it's interesting how, how these things, like even th though they're far apart in time, like you starting those courses back in the day and then the COVID thing happening, like how, how all of that is connected. But I think this conversation is going pretty well, I might say. <laughs> um, it feels like it's going very, very fluently. Um, maybe before we dive into more specific things, uh, maybe it's also good for everybody to know like, the background from Roger now, um, because otherwise it might be too far into the, the other questions to okay. get into that. Yes. Well, I started uh, studying biomedical sciences in 1990 already. Uh, I studied here at Maastricht University, where I also work right now. And actually, Maastricht University was a university was, which was founded in the 1970s, already starting immediately with problem-based learning. Right? So they were one of the front runners with including uh, uh, problem-based learning in medical in medical education, biomedical education, etc. So I grew up with problem-based learning as a first-year student, and now in 2002 I started teaching with problem-based learning. So I know it from both sides, right? As a student as well as uh, as teacher, and yeah, I like the system a lot, right? Because um, you as a teacher, you are no longer, I, I would say, you are no longer the, the teacher telling the students what to do, but you are much more a coach who helps the students to develop themselves. And I like that much more, uh, let's say, at the university level, right? So where you are actually dealing with grown-ups who all have their own opinion, right? <laughs> and uh, and I think that, that that system works very fine at, the, at that level, right? So um, overall, we, we uh, have implemented problem-based learning uh, in, in different, in different uh, uh, curricula, medicine, biomedical sciences, uh, health sciences, and it works actually uh, in all those, uh, in all those uh, uh, curricula, I think. What did you like the oh. best? Sorry to interject here quickly. Like being a student or being a teacher? Yeah, the teacher? <laughs> uh, right. When you grow older, you, uh, you want to be the, the, the teacher, of course. Um, yeah. As a student, I liked it a lot. Uh, because I had a very laid back personality, right? I was very waiting for others to contribute and I then formed my own opinion. And I think in problem-based learning, you really have to step up and you have to do uh, do your own, as I said before, you have your own role in, in the whole process. And that I learned a lot of that uh, from that, right? So I think it, uh, it, it it's not only that you learn, uh, um, that you learn how to, how to learn uh, facts, but you also learn how to collaborate. You learn how to lead discussions. And I think that is something that is uh, also very valuable coming out of problem-based learning. Yeah, Roger, yeah, I totally agree with you. For me, I think it's not only learning the content, but it's uh, becoming a lifelong learner as well. Exactly. You know, in yeah. the health professions, we've got to be lifelong learners. And yes. PBL really helps with that. Yeah, you get into a certain system where you find your own information, learn this information, apply that information. And that's our, as a researcher, that's our yeah. daily job, right? You have to find your interface, inter uh, information, you interpret it, and then you come up with your next experiment, right? Okay. So it's it's much more than just having knowledge. It's also applying that knowledge and, and uh, understanding the connections, these kinds of things. And PBL really works in that. By the way, I call it PBL, right? Um, because they also mentioned already uh, CBL, which is case-based learning. And that's yeah. actually what we do in Maastricht, right? We go from case yeah. to case with students. 
Uh, so we have a, 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 a case, a problem, and they they work on that problem for a week more or less, uh, and then we go to the next case, right? So this is actually what we uh, what we do in in Maastricht. Yeah, it's interesting because I, I happened to go to the SHE program in Maastricht a few okay. years ago because I was helping the Catholic University in Portugal were opening a new faculty of medicine and they had purchased the Maastricht curriculum. So they asked a group of us to go there with them. And and I remember raising my hand at one point and saying, what I'm hearing you saying actually is you might be doing some PBL, but you're doing more CBL than PBL. And yeah, said, and, and yes, I have to admit, right, we are working together in this EU project, Erasmus project, um, with people from Toulouse as well. And in the beginning, we had quite some discussion on PBL. In our case, it's we call it problem-based learning. In Toulouse, it was a project-based learning, PBL, right? So it, there was some discussion going on. Hey, yeah. what are you doing there, right? <laughs> so in the beginning, we were not talking to each other, but next to each other. Yeah. Uh, maybe that's also a good a good first question for both of you here. What are like the, the main key ingredients for a successful PBL and, and some other key aspects that they should know um, before they actually start diving into this? One key thing is that students are busy with the content more actively because they don't only have to study it, they also have to understand it because at the end they have to explain it to each other. Um, so as a teacher, you are actually much more, in, as I said, in the coaching role Right, making sure that nothing that is being said is wrong, or you are you directing them a little bit or helping them out a little bit, uh, but eventually they have to do it themselves. Whereas in the traditional teaching with lectures, you as a teacher you are in the lead because you convey your message, and then it's their problem, right? <laughs> so you you convey your message, and then they have to learn it, uh, and and um, and they have to make sure they understand, etc. And that doesn't always work. And I think that's the strong part of problem-based learning, that the students have to be active with the knowledge that they get. And then they have to explain it to each other because at the time when you are able to explain a thing, then you understand. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I think that whole active learning part is very important. And within the context of theories, you know, learning theories or learning approaches, it's very much of a a social constructive learning approach we're coming together. For me, problem-based learning means many different things for different people. And it's it's what's unfolded is a spectrum. Uh, because if you look at the, uh, and I dare to use the word, the purest form of it. In other words, people who believe very strongly, this is it and this is how it was meant to be and this is how you apply it, recognizing that different people use it in different ways. But the process starts with a, a real-world problem or a real-world case. So right away, you start connecting different aspects. So in medicine, for example, in the old days, we used to learn pharmacology and then pathology and then this. And, and then when we came to the patients, we, we weren't able to connect the dots there. Whereas with problem-based learning, you're given a, a real-world case or a problem. You then have to identify what you need to know in order to start solving that. So it gets you thinking uh, critically uh, and cognitively engaged in the process of asking, okay, what do I need to know here in order to be able to start um, addressing this problem, start solving the problem or caring for the case? Uh, and, and you do that through a small group uh, process. Different folks are assigned different tasks to go read up and learn, as as Jorge, um described. And the facilitator's role, and, and we can have a whole discussion about what what constitutes a good facilitator. Is it a content expert, or is it someone who doesn't know the content but is a very good facilitator, or or both? And I would say ideally both, but we can come back to that one. They then guide the people in the direction and then they go they study they come back they teach each other the facilitators there to guide them and the process continues so it's an iterative process of identifying questions going out finding the answers coming back together learning in toulouse with a project-based learning it's actually 
every time you have such a cycle, but it's all around one diff one big problem, right? Well, well. Whereas we here in Maastricht, we have uh, a chunks of small problems. And then in one cycle in which students go looking for the information and then reporting back to each other, explaining it to each other, mm -hmm. stop. Then we go to the next problem, right? So it's 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 much more in chunks, mm -hmm. but you can decide to make, let's say, a problem that you have to deal with over two or three weeks, right? That's that's possible. Yeah. yeah. What would be a, a good case, for example, to to handle in one of these PBLs? Uh, sure. Actually, I'll give an example of a recent um uh learning um activity that, that i'm doing so at the university of navarre for example there is no teaching at the moment around quality improvement what is quality improvement and what are the different methods of quality improvement so starting so i've convened a group of students and together we're going to co-design a course for the medical school on quality improvement because i've done a lot of this in canada but instead of standing there and just giving a, a lecture, which to Roger's point, then just, uh, you know, that you don't engage them. It's, it's, it, um, it, 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 it doesn't catalyze their thinking. So I've got some examples. I've got some problems. So one problem is one that I actually experienced many years ago in my clinical practice where I was working on a palliative care unit. And as part of the usual quality improvement process, we asked patients what the experience was and families and, and patients were saying that they felt that we as doctors were not spending enough time with the patients. Now, that's a problem, especially in palliative care, right? So so I'm going to say this to them and say, okay, so what do we do now? Do we do something about it or not? I'm not going to tell them what we did, what the process was, what quality improvement was. Let them start asking the questions. And then, so I'm hoping, and, and my role as a facilitator is that they're going to say like, okay, well, we've got to improve things. Good. What do you call that? So what is quality improvement? One of you have to go read up on what, what is quality improvement, the, the core principles. As part of, core, of a quality improvement, you do a root cause analysis. You go find out why is this happening? So someone can go read up on what are the different methods to try and figure out what the root cause problem is. And so, so you identify these three or four things. And then we say, okay, folks, go back and read. And next week when we come back together again, I want each of you to present to the class what you found. And, and only then do I start revealing what I do know. Um, and by the way, in the meantime, they might come back with stuff that I don't know that's new. So it helps me as well. Yeah. So that's, I mean, that's an example. The other one we're doing it is how to integrate palliative care in the care of someone with advanced uh, lung disease. So the, the case we provide is a case is of a patient with very advanced chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. And and then we asked them, so they've been learning about COPD, chronic obstructive airway disease, but they've learned nothing about what part of care is and how to integrate it. So say, okay, what else do we need to know about this person? What quality of life? Well, how do you assess quality of life, et cetera? So, so that starts the process. Okay. And then maybe I can give a short example from a biomedical science's point of view. And I and I think the example that I can give is actually one of the cases we start off with with biomedical sciences here in Maastricht. It's actually a discussion between students. So students are sitting in their in their classroom waiting for the teacher to come for their first PBL, and they and one of them is waiting and he takes his Snickers, uh, starting to eat the Snickers. And then the other student says, hey, that's not healthy, right? Uh, you can better, you can take a banana, right? And then the other one says, hey, come on. It's containing fats, sugars, just like uh, like just like other foods. Well, what's the difference, right? It's uh, There's no difference there, right? And, and, and that leads them to a discussion until the teacher comes in and he says, well, this is problem-based learning. You find out yourself. So that's the, uh, right? And, and then they have to find out, okay, what are fats? What are sugars? How are they? What, what, what is the composition and what is actually the difference between, let's say, a sugar in a banana and a sugar in the, uh, in the, uh, in the, in the Snickers. Right? So, so it cannot, it's well, not I'm going to really, learn that because I've got a sweet tooth. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that's what I mean. Right? So, but it's, it's not only, let's say, you can, you can, of course, take very clinical examples or biomedical examples, but as this is a very simple example, right? Just a, a daily discussion, 
and from that you can make a start um, uh, for for finding out things, right? So what was it? What is it? What is the difference? Why are the refined sugars in a Snickers different from a sugar in the banana, right? So it's uh, this is, or in an apple, or so, right? Uh, so what what is these kinds of things you need to trigger the students to try to find it out? I think it also depends on like the accessibility. I think like if students starting out with PBL, it might be different than somebody who is already been doing that. And for example, the the um, palliative care. Like that's a whole different type of uh, of case study, of course, with differences in how do you treat the, those people. No. So I think this is something that comes back to what you mentioned earlier, both of you, is that the teacher's role is becoming more a role of being a facilitator instead. What does that mean, being a facilitator in those instances? What's well, interesting because there's a whole literature base around this uh, about <clears throat> who is the ideal. A facilitator in a in PBL, and there's different schools of thought, as I said earlier. And there's one school of thought that says you've got to know the content uh, to some degree, but, uh, um, and some feel no, you've got to know it very well, like an expert. Um, the problem is, for example, in palliative care, there are not, not many teachers. So how on earth can you do you know train 100, 200 students with only three or four stu uh, teachers? So you've got to train others in order to know some of the content. But then there's this another school of thought that says the facilitator's role is only to facilitate. So you can bring someone in who knows nothing about quality improvement or about um, uh, about palliative care, but their role is to guide and keep people engaged and just help with the process. Um, I mean, as a for me, it was a very big jump because unlike Roger, I, I didn't train in a, in, in a PBL environment. I learned that once you know, a few years after I'd finished my my training, um, but for me, what was very difficult was to transition from being this the sage on the stage where you know a lot of stuff and you're there, you know, to to teach and to tell and to share, to holding back and facilitating the process. I personally think that the ideally one needs a facilitator who does know some of the content. And can help because some because learners sometimes don't know what they don't know. We we don't know what we don't know often, right? Mm -hmm. And it's so a form one of, of the validation. Great, yeah, and... yeah, and one of the great fear of learners is that they're going to go down rabbit holes, or they're going to go down somewhere that is not important because they don't know the maybe the clinical context mm -hmm. in the clinical or in the health sciences. So the facilitator needs to be there to to I think to guide them. But it, it's a it's a big it's a big change from. Being the person on the, you know, at, um, at the lectern to, to facilitating, and the t and it's all in the timing. It's knowing how to ask questions that are open to get people thinking. So, for example, if a student says a response to, okay, you know, the definition as I know part of care is the following, and it's and it's and it's wrong. You can't say no wrong. wrong. You're going to say things like, "Does anyone else have another idea, or are there other?" Are there other opinions on this? Yeah. yeah, I like that. I like that a lot, right? So you are not there as a as a judge, right? Because also, yeah. if you are sitting there in, as teacher as a judge and you say that's not good, that you're saying this, that's incorrect. People they don't want to share their their, their knowledge, yeah. right? Because they are afraid to say something bad, um, so, or something wrong, right? So you have to allow people to make mistakes, and and that's not easy as a teacher of course um but but in the, in the in the beginning of the process of course it's very nice if they make mistakes because i think that is also a learning event right because if they then go and look up the stuff they find out hey what i thought was wrong and then you you remember it better i would say um but later on in the process when you're more or less rounding it up if then somebody says something that is wrong then you you indeed should avoid uh, of course, correcting people because then next time they will shut up, which you don't want. Exactly. Um, and 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 so you have to find a good way as a as a facilitator to 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 tackle that that mistake that is being made. If everything goes right, the students will correct themselves, right? Because if some if one of the students says something wrong, other students will 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 correct it and will say, "Hey, I found something else, or I interpreted something in a different way." Right, so that's the learning from each other, right? So, and then that means as a teacher, um, if everything goes as it should be, 
you as a teacher can be quiet, right? Just watch the dynamics in the group and watch what they are saying. And, and that that's actually ideal, right? Yeah, I think a lot of it has to do as teachers creating a safe space. Exactly. What yeah. Roger said, what I mean. so people are comfortable making a mistake. So in, in this courses that I spoke about earlier, the LEAP courses, for example, in the very first module, we're introducing, but now these are healthcare professionals. These are people in practice already, although we do sometimes bring in students and residents into that training. Um, we, we, we're trying to teach them a, a foundational piece around not just kind of care, but healthcare is, is humility um, and self-awareness, right? And so we actually start off with an exercise where we as facilitators tell them the story where we got something wrong. Yeah. And that already sets us, like we've also come from a place of not knowing. So, so creating a safe space is important and learning things like, and for me, it's an ongoing uh, uh, effort. Um, my, my background, sometimes I, I can jump to things very quickly. Um, but um, so, for example, if someone says something that is completely incorrect, one can all, one could say things like, "If this is," and the, only you only say it if it's authentic. Is you know, I thought so too as well, but I've come to learn another point of view. Does anyone have any others? Or you know, what you just said is such a common perception. I'm glad you said that because it helps us really with the learning. Things like that are little are little phrases, little ways of creating that safe space. But like Roger said, never judge. Like where on earth did you get that? But I, I like your I like your your example in which you say you 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 present your own mistakes to the students yep. because then you show that it's not bad to be vulnerable Definitely. and to to make mistakes, right? Because Definitely. yeah, I, and that's and that's also what I like about uh, about problem based learning is that I also can share. As teacher, I can share the experiences that I have as a researcher, and then even as you said, um, sharing the mistakes that I made, right? And 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 then they can learn from my mistakes, and I think that's that's mm -hmm. quite quite interesting. Yeah. But then, of course, you need, as as was said before, you need a teacher who is an expert in this field or works in that field. But at Maastricht University, we do not necessarily have teachers that are in depth. Um, and knowledgeable. We some, sometimes we even have student tutors, as we call them, right? So then students help the group. Of course, they are older years, uh, or maybe, maybe masters teach in the bachelor. Um, but but we always have uh, um, what we call tutorial notes, in which the 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 the, info, the minimal information that they need to know is in, is given to the to the to the instructor or to the to the coach or or. Yeah. Uh, to the teacher, right? So um, yeah, those are very helpful. Those notes, because they yes, those yes, these notes are really helpful because, helpful. yeah, you know, uh, you don't want them, as you said, you don't want them to go down in the rabbit hole or go something in completely the wrong direction, not or not the direction that you wanted to go them to go, right? And then these tutorial notes, they they really direct the discussion, of course. Um, and then if they go to a diff different path, you as a teacher, you can correct them. To go to the path that you want them to teach uh, to learn. Yep. Uh, so me as a, a content creator, but also like somebody who, like as a science communicator, I'm always looking like how do people communicate. I think what I get away from this is that facilitators really do have to at least uh, work on their empathic listening skills, um, yep. like to learn like how to communicate with people. First of all, um, have people skills, but I think. I don't know if this is an issue, maybe for both for one of you or, but I think some teachers out there like are the sage um, on the stage. So I think maybe it also has a little bit of to do with hum humility, hum being humble as a teacher to to put yourself in the shoes of the of the students and not being like, I know everything. Listen to me as that person. I don't know if that's an issue that you come across with other teachers or you feel like people like teachers are more humble or less egocentric in those regards. Look, I, I like what the, the analogy or the use of empathy, because I think you, you, mm -hmm. you nailed it. Um, it needs empathy. Look, we all have different styles um, and, and that's OK. And as long as we are aware of when to use which one um, and we're aware of that, that we don't always fall into that one the whole time. 
I mean, look, at the end of the day, I feel that there's a, we, there are two boxes. There's a toolbox from a, learning, a learner perspective. There's a toolbox from a teacher perspective. And inside these toolboxes are different tools. And I think we need to use the right tool for the, for the right competency, the right learning objective at hand. And sometimes it's not always PBL. So I, I would say PBL constitutes m maybe less than PBL in, in, in the way that I'm thinking of it, like the purest way, maybe less than 20% of what I do. CBL, because I see it slightly different, although they linked a lot more. But it's finding the right tool at the right time um, for, for, for the right job. Um, well, I, I, would, I would like to add uh, that having a different teacher Right, is because in the, in the in the uh, Maastricht we have courses of eight weeks, and each tutorial group group of students has a tu tutor or a facilitator mm -hmm. uh, for those eight weeks, and then they switch to another course, different facilitator, different tutor, another course, different tutor, so they also experience that the yep. tutor can have different um, characteristics, a different uh, personality, etc. Mm. But that's also, again, real life, right? So you collaborate with people all over the world as a researcher, and they all have their own characteristics and their own personality. So you have to deal with that in meetings, etc. Yep. And that's also why we switch our teachers, uh, because um, yeah, you, you have to learn to deal with different situations. You have to adapt to the situation. I think that's also part of the PBL learning. Do you feel by adapting to these different situations? Do you also feel like you need to adapt to differences in speed or differences in learning styles from students? Or do you feel like that, that isn't that big of a problem when you're dealing with like a wide range of, of different students here? That's a good question. Uh, again, there's a whole body of literature around different <laughs> learning styles, right? And methods and approaches. <laughs> Look, I, I think as a teacher, we've got to be cognizant of the fact that we all learn different and we have right. different styles. Uh, and people got different learning styles. I, I think what's important, and I do think that PBL actually helps a lot with this, is learning different learning styles. Um, at the core of it all is something which I think is profoundly important, and I think is becoming even more important as artificial intelligence becomes like, like a big thing, and that's curiosity. Yeah. PBL nurtures curiosity. Like, why, 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 why? Explain. Let me understand this. Connect the dots. And at a time of AI, where simply you go to chat GPT and it gives you some responses, I think one of the great, I think there's a lot of potential in AI and it's going to be a very powerful tool. But I think one of the uh, pitfalls of it is that it might stifle curiosity. So I think PBL might become even more important from the perspective of nurturing that curiosity. So no matter what your learning style is, to go back to your question, I think at the bottom of it all should be the sense of curiosity, humility. Um, and then I think as teachers, if we can, I mean, we don't have to cater for all these different styles. I mean, there'll be a schizophrenic event uh, you know, with 10 things and different thoughts. You don't know what's happening. But if you can just yeah. do you know, exercises, some that appeal for the more, you know, those that like seeing pictures or, or active learning versus others who prefer yeah. more passive. Yeah, so I, I think it's 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 very difficult to adapt to each separate learning style, right? Um, but I think what you can take into account is maybe the speed of learning because some people do it very quickly, some take a little bit longer to, to, to get things done. Um, so if you would have your, your first discussion about a problem and then students, they they go for themselves to find out uh, um, the literature, read the literature, get the knowledge, etc. And then they come back to have the final discussion or to have a discussion about it. What we do is we take a time span between these two sessions, which would fit, let's say, to most of the students, right? Because it's not no use if somebody comes to the second meeting unprepared because he didn't was unable to do it uh, in that in that uh, uh, time frame. Right, so I, I would say that is the, that is something that in which we adapt, or we adapt the case, or we adapt the time, more or less. We as we adapt the case actually because we have a fixed time frame. Um, but but that is something we can adapt, right? But 
but overall adapting to each um, learning style is not possible. But I think allowing different learning styles, that is, that is of course, possible. So I like the way you yeah. put that. I've, um, and that reminds me, actually, you said something that in the, in the health professionals in medicine, one of the things we try and nurture is professionalism and the concept of professionalism. You know, in PBL, there's a component of professionalism that comes to the fore. So I think it's a very powerful tool to nurture the concept of a commitment to others, a commitment to oneself uh, 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 as a student, and a, but a commitment to your colleagues that if I don't do my part, it's not just me that's not going to learn, my colleagues won't learn as well. And it's a commitment as well to society and the communities that we work in, and that is that we are learning and we're learning together and we are together to help uh, society. So I think there's a lot of, you know, we spoke about, I spoke about curiosity, but, you know, uh, um, Roger mentioned collaborative learning, collaborating, communicating. There are a lot of strengths around um, around PBL, uh, but there are weaknesses as well. Uh, so, yeah. Is it, could you maybe that elaborate on the weaknesses that you see? Uh, well, <laughs> yeah. So it's always interesting. Yeah, so I'm going to preface this with different PBL can mean different things for different people, right? So <laughs> yes. if you if you take the the purest form of it, and I, and I, no, that's a wrong word actually. If you take this one more stricter form of it, like the original form of it, it's this iterative process. Discover the questions, go and learn, come back, teach. For me, one of the biggest limitations is the efficiency. It's it's not efficient. So, in a time now where we've got so much to learn, there's so much information. And part of having to navigate all of this is having to learn where to go find information and discern what is good and what's not so good information. But I think we have to also be cognizant of efficiency. So PBL, in its in that strict form of it, or that iterative process, I'd um, you know identify the questions and then go and learn, come back, identify, learn, and then identify the next questions. Can be cannot be efficient because in, in in that very strict original form of it which and there's a role still for it i think i'm not saying there's a role i think you know just highlighted why i think as a strength um it's a long it can be a long drawn out process and and usually starts without the learners usually not really knowing exactly what the learning objectives are and then they construct that but if you take the spectrum of pbl at the other end of the spectrum is there's the learning objectives already defined up front so the difference for me between PBL and CBL is with CBL, you've got the case, it's defined, uh, it's it's defined to its contents, it's defined to the time, you've got the learning objective set out, you build in the questions to facilitate the, the discussions, um, and so it becomes a bit more efficient. Um, so I would say I do more CBL than PBL, but it is. Yeah. I think it's still important to do some of the PBL because there's, there's things that you learn, these other skill sets that you're not going to learn elsewhere, I think. Yeah, but also also uh, with regard to stuff that you need, right? Yeah, exactly. Because if you were to, let's say you have 400 students. Exactly. Um, uh, if you have the classical teaching style, that means you have one teacher in front of 400 students and he tells them or she tells them what to do, right? Or what to know. Whereas in problem-based learning, you make smaller groups. You make groups of 10, 10 yep. students, for instance, or, or 12. Right? We, uh, here at Basic, we use 12. Uh, but if, imagine if you would have groups of 10, you need 40 teachers yep. right, to, to, to be there with those students and discuss with those students. I'm not, I'm not going 40 times with it. Right? Exactly. So you need more, more staff to make it work. Right, and that's that's one one of the burdens of problem based learning. I think yeah. it, it needs more staff uh, to make it uh, to make it work. Yeah, totally. Yeah, agree. this is actually this is actually a question I had um, come in from um, one of my PhD friends who's now also doing more teaching. Um, he was wondering in what instances wouldn't be advisable to use these PBL uh, says like the approach. Maybe even the the CBL. Like, when is the traditional teaching method a better method to use, and when would you think like, no, let's switch this to PBL, CBL, all the B, 
all the PLs. Yeah. I, I think there is a risk in what you say of switching, right? Yes. Because we have in the, we have made a mistake in the past mm -hmm. that we started off a curriculum with mm -hmm. um, the classical style and mm -hmm. then switched to problem-based learning or uh, case with cases. <laughs> because the students became lazy because they thought, okay, if somebody tells me what to do, I know it, right? Which is not true, but they think so. Um, so when you then start off with traditional style and you want to switch, that makes it, makes it difficult because the students will complain about the problem-based learning because then they have to work, <laughs> right? Yes. So because they became lazy, just listening and, and, and knowing what to do, instead of finding your own information, studying it, trying to explain it, etc. right? So switching from one system to the other system is all the time. I think that's, that's a risk. So I think you have to stick to one or the other. Yes, so in this instance, for example, that would mean he as a teacher is now used to teaching the, the traditional method. And let's say like next year, he would want to integrate the the PBL and the, the case studies also. So I think in that instance, it would be a little bit different. He can switch the course into more cases. But is there something that, that is like, should be off grounds for this? Or do you feel like there's always a possibility to use this approach? But you know, I think there's some some areas it's pretty obvious you're not going to use PBL. Um, for example, sometimes you do have to give a class to 200 students at the same time. You know, and, and you've only got, let's just say, one or two hours to cover that particular topic. You're not yeah. going to go to PBL because it's not going to be... Because of logistics. Logistics, efficiencies, etc. So, so there you can, you can use a lecture effectively provided you put in some um, activities or, or exercises that can engage and, and engage your learners. And, and that's where you could bring in a form of case-based learning into something like it's okay, here's a case, what do you think, et cetera. Mm -hmm. You can use interactive, you know, or, um, um, audience response systems that you're responding, et cetera. I, uh, even CBL, I think, is also best done in small groups. So in the courses that we do, those LEAP courses, that there are about 650 happening every year in Canada. So almost every day, there's two of these somewhere in Canada happening. Uh, we, we limit the number of learners to each of these courses to not more than 25 or 30. Yeah. And then within the 25 or 30, we do small group learning where we break them up into groups of about five or six using cases because we've got them there for only a day or two. PBL is not going to work. But we want to connect the real world with with the concepts. Um, and the other nice thing about case based learning is that you can also bring in variations on the theme. So, for example, in patients with very advanced cancer, sometimes there's a place for artificial hydration with fluid, and sometimes there isn't. And so, you can vary the cases uh, to illustrate this um, this variation, which is the real world. Um, so I think that's where I would probably use CBL more or wouldn't use PBL. But if there's a topic where it's a longitudinal problem and you, and you want them to, to go on this voyage of discovery and communicate with each other and learn with each other, start learning how to facilitate small group learning, which is a competency as well for healthcare professionals, then I would... I will look at a PBL approach. But like Roger said, the, the big limiting factor here is often who the teachers are, even even the students, you know, even if we use the students. No, yeah, I, I agree with that, right? So, uh, of course, sometimes you cannot avoid having a lecture, uh, but then we, I would prefer what, what, what we are also working on here now at Master University is make knowledge clips, right? Instead of making a lecture... Mm -hmm. Of of one hour, one and a half hours, because people will lose track at the, at a certain time, right? Because or will not absorb anymore. So if you can cut that into smaller pieces, explaining concepts in smaller pieces as knowledge clips, that would help. Or what another thing that we are working on is to make the lectures more interactive, right? As as mentioned before, you can have let's say 
um, questionnaires during a lecture, right? How do you feel about this? What is your opinion? Or a voting system, right? That people can vote on certain mm. standpoints or a point of views. I think that makes it more appealing, right? Because mm. you you don't just sit there and listen, but then you also attract the people in. And I think yeah. that's something that we also have to take into account so that if, if problem-based learning or uh, case-based learning is not possible mm -hmm. and you have to do lectures, make those lectures more appealing, make them interesting for the students. I think that's that's one of the things that we are also working on here. I'm intrigued by yeah. the concept of the knowledge clips. Maybe <laughs> offline we can to... talk about it. This is actually interesting because we're doing a podcast on this so you can oh, listen, you listen to, to the, the next podcast. podcast. <laughs> <That's interesting. laughs> Please let me know yes. when that's happening. Really want to... Yes, that's definitely something that I think is really important. Um, like me, myself, as a science communicator as well, I'm really into the the fact of, like, let's mm -hmm. make more bite-sized type of uh, knowledge clips here. So that is something I'm really, really interested to dive into and explain mm -hmm. more in that uh, So that's that a podcast. nice bridge to the next podcast. Uh, yeah, so <laughs> if everybody here is listening to this and they want to explore that more, let's, let's go to the next podcast. No, <laughs> but if you have some questions, like, about that definitely send me some questions that we can um Mercy. ask the, the other guest who's working on that the next time um something that you mentioned here um maybe you can like we already talked about this but the um, the accountability and like the the interest of the students themselves like when are they lazy when are they actually really involved in what they're doing with do you have some insights on that like are there some some good tips for people to define a, a case study that's actually working uh, for the students? Or do you feel like it's always like you have to pull the students through? No, no, of course, you don't have to pull them through all the time because there is, of course, as mentioned before, there, there should be some kind of curiosity which, which you grow in the students also by this system. But of course, not every student is the same. Some somebody is interested in the brain. Another one wants to know more about the heart or the lungs, you know. Or um, so there is, of course, a natural, uh, a natural. Let's say, what subject Affinity? do you appeals more to you? And if you then, of course, are in a course on a subject that does not appeal, it's more difficult for you as a student, right? But I think if if you are in a course that appeals to you as a student. Ah, uh, yeah. Then, then the sky is the limit, right? Because you, uh, we also, we don't. I don't stop students, right? If they do more than they should, please be my be my guest, right? So uh, if there's nothing wrong with knowing more than you should for an exam, right? So, uh, so if students are, if you, if it is appealing for you, then you go. It's easier than if it is not. But that's that's just personal, which means also one course is more interesting than the other course. The other thing I think is interesting in Maastricht is that, so I must confess, I've got to confess something here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and, Live on the podcast. Yeah, because <laughs> it goes to the point about the learning styles. And sometimes there's some universities that some students just do better in just because of, this, of the styles and the learning approach. So I've got a daughter who was studying at a Canadian university, but it was more the wrote approach and and I've known her as someone who's practical gets on with it, the practical stuff and she wanted to do public health so I one day said to her listen I think I know just the right university for you uh, Maastricht and she applied for it and she got into Maastricht so she ended up doing a undergraduate degree in public health at Maastricht and loved it this whole PBL for her was just phenomenal and then she stayed on to do a master's degree in global. So she did the European uh, public health degree, and then she did okay. the global, and she loved it. Today, she tells, you know, in a job that she's now got, she's working in London in a, in a, in a public health enterprise. And the skill sets that she learned through this small group are standing her in such fantastic stead. So she's, but one of the things she would say to me, she would, we would say, listen, We've got a family get together. I'm flying over from Canada. We're going to Portugal. Come to us. She said, No, I can't miss my, I cannot miss my tutorials, my small groups. <laughs> so it became evident to me that Maastricht is very strict about attendance. You've got to attend these, these tutorials. 
you know, I, I mean, there's a, there's a bit of a leeway, but it's not a very big stretch. It's just, there's there's a there's a threshold there about how many you miss, which I think is is useful. And and she herself realised the importance of this because sometimes when one or two colleagues in her small tutorials weren't there, the rest of the group then felt like there's something missing. So the other the other thing I think is invariably there's going to be a student who the laggard who just doesn't come or doesn't do their piece. And I, and and it'd be interesting listening to her as a learner. Like it, they go through a lot of angst about this um, as a learner because they want to say to the person, listen, you know, come on, roll up your sleeves and contribute to the rest of us. Our learning depends on you as well. Then there's also the, the element of, well, if they don't do it, we have to we have to cover that up. So it adds workload onto us. Um, and then at the end of the day, uh, about authenticity and accountability, to your point, is why am I doing the work for someone else when they should be doing it? But they struggle with how do they, what do they do with this colleague that's not participating? Do they yeah, and I, I think that's a good point because we find it very important uh, to give feedback to each other, Right. <laughs> So exactly. almost That's... every session we end with a feedback round uh, in which we say, okay, what, what do you think we could improve as a group? Right? And then people are really sometimes quite uh, straightforward. You have to do more, right? Nothing. And I think that's just as it is also in real world. Right, so if if I wouldn't do a thing, then my colleagues will tell me, hey, uh, you should reach your deadline. And, and I think that's in the beginning, of course, students find that difficult. Right to 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 confront each other with uh, with things they don't do, uh, but then they really t see that hey, I am involved in this process, I'm involved in the dynamics of the learning not only for myself but also in the learning from uh, for others. So uh, you feel responsible, you get this sense of responsibility. Yep, and and I think that's important. With and, regard and, to yeah, attendance, and, uh, mm -hmm. with regard to attendance, that depends on the study that you do. <clears throat> Some studies say, okay, you will need at least so much percent attendance, although less. Right, so that is depends on the type of study that you do here at Master University. But but there is a minimum level of attendance for these tutorials. Yes, yeah, which which I think is good, and I think that whole mechanism that you put in place of that accountability, where you then become accountable through your peers. And your pe your peers hold you accountable. I think that's a very powerful um, method that's built in. Yeah. So you prepare yeah. people for, let's say, the next steps in their career. Yep. Not only by giving them knowledge, but also giving them the competencies, the tools <laughs> that they need for a regular job. Working together. Yeah, it's called um, working together. Transferable skills. Giving feedback. The transferable skills. Yeah. Communicating yeah. with each other. How to how to address problems? These kind of things are all in there, right? Which sometimes are even more important because, like a lot of people, if they don't do PBL, I know because I come in contact with a lot of different type of clients, uh, type of professors that I'm working with. Like, it's not a it's not that straightforward mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. a lot of people know transferable skills. Um, so I feel like it's, it's becoming more important the way that we connect with other people as well. Yeah, I I, I think that. PBL, CBL helps a lot with those other transferable skills. Mm -hmm. And that's yeah, and the maybe, strength of these approaches. Yeah, and maybe the direct approach is more to for the Netherlands, because I know in Belgium, people are a little bit more timid in, in that regard. But I think still, it, it helps. Um, <laughs> well, we also have Tom, we also have Belgian students that are really doing a top job, right? So uh, yeah. They uh, learn. <laughs> but maybe I think people skills are like a, a main theme when it comes to, to this uh, yeah. this learning scale. Maybe one other question could be like you talked already about the peer evaluation. Um, like how do you define what is success when it comes to like a, a good case study or like a good uh, PBL that you set up? Like how do you validate if the students are actually taking away what you intended them to to learn in that course? Roger, how cool question you take it first. <laughs> Right. Yeah, yeah, difficult question, right? <laughs> yeah. it, is, it is a difficult question, but that, that is in the post discussion. Um, you discuss things, people they have to explain to each other, and you have to make sure that um, that uh, the, my, the minimum things that you want them to know have been said at least mm -hmm. in this in this in this discussion. Um, 
And of course, there, like a, of course, you example... can go into much more depth. Um, but but it's it's uh, that's a little bit individual. If you like it, you go into more depth. If you don't, you take the minimum, right? So, but eventually, yeah, we know you know if if they make an exam and they fa- and they pass, then you know that they that they know the right stuff. Um, of course, there are now also more and more and seeing whether we could can get rid of exams, right? So much more building portfolios and these kind of things. But I think yeah, still knowledge is important, right? So um, yeah, I think that's that's the final the final proof is if they are able if they go into the jobs and they are able to do what we want them to do, then we know that they that they did it correctly, right? But at the spot, yes. whether you know whether they did it, it's it's also it's. It, but I also say often is this is also adult education, right? So if they don't do what they should do. It's not my responsibility. It's their own teaching, right? So they, they are responsible for their own learning uh, environment, and um, they you can they can decide to do the minimum, but they can also decide to do more. Um, but it, it is it is indeed an, an issue on on yeah. How do you check whether they did everything? You see how how do you think about that? Yeah, look, I think you've got more experience than I have on this one. Um, okay. I think, you know, you've got formative and you've got the summative evaluation. And yeah, I totally yeah. agree with you with the summative evaluations that end, whether they are passing the examinations or the in-training evaluations. But I wonder sometimes whether there isn't a, a role for, as so I was intrigued by you, what's it, your knowledge clips? Because maybe there's also a role here for a quick summary of the key, key points. You know, it's interesting... Um, so, some of the journals that that one r- reads, for example, it starts off with what was known before, you know, what did, what did the study show, what are the key points? And I'm, I'm wondering whether maybe, depending on which year you're in, like if, you know, depend, obviously, the further you go into your into your training, the more uh, you could apply these adult principles that you're responsible, as, as Roger said. But perhaps in the earlier phases is like a, a summary of these are the key points. Uh, for yeah. example, last week I was involved in a two-hour ses- um, uh, session on uh, integration of palliative care into patients with advanced lung disease, and there were this discussions occurring. Now this was this was a, a, you know almost two hundred students there, and and afterwards I was reflecting on it with the person that. Um, uh, with one of our younger staff who who wants to learn and I think has got fantastic potential as a teacher. I say, look, I think one of the things it could be that they may have walked off with the wrong with the wrong impressions. You know, if you use opioid for shortness of breath, you can, but make sure that these are the these are the clinical guidelines you've got to follow. But if they don't know what they're comparing that to something else, then you might not be able to contextualize it. So I've actually just made a note here as you're speaking because I suddenly remembered, oh my gosh, I've got to write the summary up <laughs> of the key points for the students to say, just as a follow-up for the class, here are the key things. In PBL, you have to live with a certain level of insecurity. Yep. Right? Because you never know what you whether you did enough. But it is something that people grow into and, and then maybe guidance for people who start off with PBL I think a bit more guidance is, is is maybe helpful, but later on, they students really learn how to deal with this insecurity, right? And uh, and now, as soon as yeah yeah they, they know they, they get a feeling for it, right? And uh, mm. and and I think that's that's also an important thing. Yeah. Yep. Like if somebody is really starting out as a teacher and they want to develop more into this this PBL the CBL kind of kind of approach like what are some tips you can give them to to really get into that space except just do it because that's what everybody says no, no that's i think that's too easy actually just do it i think you have to inform yourself right mm. and i think there are a lot of ways to inform yourself online but also contact university that always do already do it right there are a lot of stu- universities already doing it in different ways, by the way. Um, and I think informing yourself is, I think, the, the best way. So, because otherwise you might have expectations that are different from reality. And I think that would be a shame that you start off with it maybe and then find out it doesn't work. 
Uh, whereas if you would have first know what it means, what the, 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 the setting should be, et cetera, uh, then I think you can have a, a dream start with problem-based learning. Yeah, and I think start off with knowing different tools, different approaches. It's not just PBL, it's not just CBL, it's not just a, the you know usual approach, it's flipped learning. I mean, it's, mm-hmm. So it, just become acquainted with several tools. There's some fantastic mm-hmm. books about, you know, um, and if you want to go down the way of books, there's uh, articles. And it, as Roger said, there's now fantastic videos online. You know, what are the different... Um, teaching approaches or learning approaches rather and um, what is PBL and become acquainted with the spectrum that PBL represents because I think you know uh, people may not realize that there's actually a, a big spectrum and I would certainly say learn both PBL and CBL because they are complementary <laughs> and there's a little bit of overlap between them but they can be very useful tools selecting the right one at the right moment I've really enjoyed this. I've enjoyed the discussion. Okay. Yeah, me too. Yeah, and enjoying, I think, learning is having fun. Mm. And I think PBL is more fun than just sitting there and listening. And that wraps up our episode on problem-based learning. To reach out to our guests, you can find more information in the podcast description. Also know that there are other episodes you can listen to. For example, we have one on virtual reality in education, but also one on teaching with video. All very important topics, so definitely give them a listen. But if you want to know more about the Ralde project, I'm going to remind you, just go to ralde.eu or you can find our videos at the Ralde project on YouTube. Okay, I will hopefully hear you soon in one of the next episodes. See you.